in the book of Job, chapter 1. And this is a book many times pastors have shied away from and preachers have, have not wanted to preach and congregations have not wanted to hear from because we see it as a book of fear. There's nothing in the Bible that should give you fear. The Bible was given to give you faith. And many times Satan will take a good thing and twist it to where we're afraid to hear from it. Job is not a book on how God's going to get you. Job is a book on how God's going to bring you through and bless you and give you double for your trouble. But if you don't read it, you can't get the blessing out of it. So we're just going to get some stuff out of the book of Job today, if that's okay. But in the book of Job, chapter 1, beginning at verse 8, the Bible records these words. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for nothing? Hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thy hand now and touch all that your boy Job has and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he has is thine power only upon himself put not forth thine hand so Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord look at verse 11 again I want you to look at verse 11 with me but put forth thy hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face that is Satan talking there and he gave a prophecy that if he got his way with Job that this man that seems so good, that this man that seems so upright would actually stand in the face of God and curse him. In this passage, Satan makes a prophecy. I want to preach a little while today from the subject of when Satan prophesies. When Satan prophesies. That almost seems like a heretical statement to say when Satan prophesies. But I for one, I'm a believer in the power of prophecy. How many people do I have in here that still believe in prophecy? I believe that preaching under the Holy Ghost and under inspiration is prophecy. The Bible said Paul warned the church to never despise prophesying to never despise somebody getting up under the unction of the Holy Ghost and preaching an inspired word or giving somebody a prophecy to push them forward. There were a lot of times in my life that it seemed like I was getting ready to just give up and I, I couldn't face it, but God had given me a prophecy that built up my faith. God had given me a word from the Lord from somebody I trusted that helped me keep going when everything in me felt like falling apart. That's why Paul said, don't ever let the enemy take prophecy out of the church. Don't ever let the devil take the anointing out of the church because every now and then you're going to fight some battles in life where you're going to need to stand on a word from God. Have you ever been fighting a battle and if it had not been for the word of the Lord, you you might have lost your mind if you've ever been there I just need you to give him a hand clap of praise and let me know I'm in the right place there's something about an anointed prophecy that can push you forward there's something about the unction of the Holy Ghost that can stir up something that is within you like when Bishop Fred Brown 25 years ago pulled me out of an audience like this one when I was feeling like a nobody. I was feeling like a nothing and the enemy was whispering to me and here this man of God that did not know me pulled me out of the crowd crystal and he began to tell me what was going on in my mind, what was going on in my family and then I listened to what he said God had for my future and there were a lot of times on my journey that the enemy would try to make me believe that God had given up upon me and I wasn't going to make it and I would remember what the Lord said all those years ago and I would say if God said it back then it is true today I just want somebody to know that standing on a word my God cannot lie you're going to make it through your battle and you're going to make it through your vow let somebody give him a praise now I'm trying to pace myself but I believe there's some people in here that you're holding on to a word from God. 
Have you ever held on to a word from God when everything in your senses said give up? Have you ever held on to a word from God when it seemed like everybody around you said give up? But that word from God, you held on to it for dear life. What I found out about people that act like God speaks to them all the time is they flaky. They fruity. Well, I woke up this morning and God told me to drink black coffee. And he told me to wear my purple socks, not my pink socks. And he told me that I was to put my hair on the right side. I, Shut up. That's why people don't listen to that. When you make God silly, everybody turns out. I can't get, we ain't gonna make God silly at City on the Hill. When our God speaks, hell moves. When our God speaks, rivers part. Somebody give God a praise. We ain't gonna make God silly up in here. I've seen people with this silly stuff. And then the world says that's silly. When my God speaks, cheers, shivers will run up your spine. When my God speaks, your heart will begin to beat with hope. When my God speaks, hard hearts will begin to melt in the power of God. When my God speaks, eyes that ain't teared up in years will begin to cry like a baby. Don't reduce the voice of God to your flesh. Because when God speaks, somebody that says there is no hope says, there is hope. Somebody contemplating suicide says, I'm not going to take my life. Don't reduce the voice of God to what kind of Cheerios you eat in the morning because it makes people tune out. When God speaks, things shift. When God speaks, things change. The Bible talked about a people that prophesy out of their own spirit. I've seen people mad at people before and basically cuss them out in the name of Jesus. We have been in church. Me and, me and Pastor Carlene have been in church, and we knew this one woman was mad. You were there, Karen. This one woman was mad, and she didn't like it. So what she did was she went up to this person and said, blah, 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 thus saith the Lord. And we knew that wasn't the Lord. That was her because she was mad. And all I've ever seen that do is drive people out of church and drive people out of the presence of God. I'm of this opinion. If you took the time to get here this morning, you deserve to hear from him and not from me. The reason I don't preach my opinion is my opinion can't help you. But if you get a word from this right here, you can take a licking and keep on ticking. The Bible teaches that there's power in prophecy. That's when somebody gets an unction and they give you something that's specifically tailor-made for your situation. My God prophesies. My God uses people to prophesy. As I'm preaching to you right now, it's a form of prophecy that God gives to stir up your faith to keep going, that God uses to make you stay in the fight and not give up in the battle. It's my prayer every time we open these doors that somebody that's about to give up and lay down and quit, that you hear something from God today that makes you stand up, put your shoulders back, and storm hell with a water pistol. I believe that. But just as surely as God speaks, the devil speaks. I knew that the title of my sermon would get your attention. When Satan prophesies, because just as surely as my God prophesies, and he'll tell you, I'm going to use you, Gideon, not based on where you've been, but based on where I'm taking. And it gave Gideon hope. He came, God came to Moses, a, a murdering refugee, and said, I'm going to make you my mouthpiece. God never spoke to anybody according to their past. But just as surely as God will prophesy, enemy will prophesy too just as surely as God will speak a word for me that says I'm bringing you to a blessed place and I've got something good for your life Jeremiah 29 11 God prophesied to a backslidden Israel and he said my thoughts for you are of good and not of evil to give you hope future and an expected end God will put you forward but the devil will also prophesy he'll show you standing over the casket of your son before he's 18. He will show you your marriage falling apart when there's nothing wrong with it. I found that just as surely as God will speak a word to your faith, the enemy will speak a word to your fear. Because within each and every one of you, there is the ability, God put it there, to have faith in God. He said, I put in every man the measure of faith. 
just as surely as you have the capacity to have great faith in God, you being human have the capacity to walk in great fear. And faith is what draws me into the purpose of God. But I found that fear is what drives me far away from God's best for my life because faith is me believing in the promise of God. But fear is that thing that the enemy uses to drive me out, to make me give up. In the book of Job, you find that God has a meeting with his council, with his people, and the sons of God had to present themselves unto God. And Satan himself was there. And he said, have you considered your servant Job? Now watch this now. We find three things out about the devil when we study this about Job. We find that Satan pays attention to people that have the favor of God on them. Somebody needs to hear this right now because you believe if you have God's favor on you, you're somehow going to go under the radar and the devil ain't going to notice you. Ask Joseph how that worked out. There was a lot of attention he didn't get until his father's favor came upon him. Satan observes people that walk in the favor of God. What I'm trying to tell somebody is if the devil's been messing with you, it's not because God has left you, it's because he sees the favor of God on you. You ought to give God a praise if you've had to fight a battle. That means the devil sees that if God is for you, who can be against you? Satanic warfare and attack is a, is a sign to me now at 44 years of age. Not that God has left me and God's gonna fail my family, but it proves to me the devil senses there's something special on my life. I'm trying to tell some of you that are in the battle and in the struggle, the enemy has sensed, Opal, that there's favor on your life. The enemy has sensed, BJ and Rachel, that there's uncommon favor on your life. He sensed this favor. The enemy also sees, according to this scripture, when God is protecting somebody even when they don't know it. Because Satan said, I would have touched him and I would have taken him out, but you got a hedge put up round about him and I can't even get to him. I feel like preaching about right now because Job didn't even know how good God was really being to him. Job didn't even know, Psalms 34, that the angels of the Lord encampeth round about those that fear him. What I'm trying to tell somebody is you don't even know how God good's been to you. If it had not been for the Lord, you would have had a car wreck. If it had not been for God, you would have had a heart attack. But God put a hedge of protection and told Haley, I need somebody to give God a praise for the stuff you don't know about, for the times he made a way when you didn't even know he was making a way. Satan sees the protection you don't see. Satan sees the times he wanted to snatch you up. But there were angels running about you, Brandon. Angels run about you, Emily and Amy. Satan said there's an unseen force that protects Mikey. I'd have done wiped him out. I just want you to give God a hand clap of praise for the blood right now. Because it's the blood of Jesus that made the death angel walk away. It's the blood of Jesus that got me up out of that car wreck. It's the blood of Jesus that kept me from losing my mind. It's the blood of Jesus that got you through that funeral. I need somebody to give God a praise. Woo. I'm trying to not get too hyper yet. But when I think about the blood, I wouldn't be here if it had not been for the blood of Jesus. There's a third thing to consider. Satan also studies your worship and your motive, Ellis. This amazed me because Satan didn't just see God, Job giving sacrifices to God. He saw what he was doing, but he also saw why he was doing it. Job was not giving these sacrifices on a continual basis, some say daily, the word of God says continual, so we don't know if it's weekly, daily. We just know he did it a lot. Job would give sacrifices, Kelly, but he wasn't giving them because of how good God had been to him. The Bible said he was giving these sacrifices because he had a fear in his heart that his children would curse God in their heart. And sometimes what we're worried about in somebody else reveals a weakness we might have in ourselves. And Satan not only observed his manner of worship, Carlene, 
He not only observed him coming to his whatever temple he had and making a sacrifice to God, he studied why he was doing it. See, there's a lot of people coming to church today all across America, not because of how good God has been to them, not because they love God because he first loved them, but they're coming to church because they fear him and they dread him and they're just trying to stay on his good side. Let me help you. I'm not coming here to make God love me. I'm coming here because I know he loves me. He loves me when I'm up and he loves me when I'm down. I wish I had some honest people. God loves you when you're worshiping and he loves you when you're worrying. Is there anybody that knows that God loves you all the time? It's not just about my worship. It's about my motive. It's not just about if I'm good to somebody. Why was I good to that somebody? Was I good to somebody just to get something off of them? Or was I good to people that actually had nothing to give me back in return? He said, I'm studying the motive of Job and I've done my research, God, and here's the deal. You turned me loose on your boy Job. I've seen the fear in his heart. You turned me loose on your boy Job and I'll get him. I'll make him curse you. Satan released a prophecy that said I'll bring him to nothing. I'll make him shake his fist up in the heavens and curse your very name. Satan loves to release a prophecy in the negative. Satan loves to release a prophecy of how you ain't going to make it. I can't tell you. I'm just going to tell them what we go through sometimes. Because I, I prayed before I did this message that God would speak to the stuff y'all are really dealing with. Because I don't believe we have time to play games. Now, I, this is going to help somebody. Some of you may leave here thinking we're crazy. That's fine. I'm getting too old to worry about it. But Carlene, I'm going to throw her under the bus first. Every time Carlene looks at the clock, for like how many years? A long time. It's, it says, that I'm just going to show you little stuff the enemy does to mess with your head. It's going to help somebody. Somebody. Every time she looks at the clock, it'll be 9-11 or 10-11 or 12-11. And so the enemy whispered to her, that's a sign that I'm going to kill Jake or I'm going to hurt Grayson. Oh, y'all y'all looking at me? Pray for her. Yeah, but the thing is, some of y'all had them same weird thoughts. And so the other day we was driving down the road. She picked up her phone. She goes, look, it says 9-11. I said, yeah, but the other 10 times you looked at it, it said something else. The enemy's just showing you the one time that you looked at that it said that. Why don't you praise God for the other 10 times that it didn't say? What I'm trying to tell somebody is the enemy will always focus you upon the one little thing rather than the great big things. Instead of complaining, you got a bump on your face. Give God a praise. You got two eyes at work. I've come to tell somebody what you amplify is what you feed. I'm going to give God a praise. I'm here this morning. I'm going to give God a I'm trying to pace myself. But before I just leave Carlene out on an island, I was the same way Uncle Mike when I was a little boy, but I was a small child. I was at Mama Pauline's house, and uh, I was watching TV. I don't know what I was watching, but I heard Mama coughing. Mama, she's tough. She don't cough much. I heard her coughing, and I knew it was a a, a desperate cough. I came running in there, and my mama had done got choked on bubble gum. That bubblicious spirit had done got hooked up in her esophagus. And I, being a little boy like I was, I didn't know the Heimlich. I didn't, but I knew Hong Kong Fui, baby. I just started hitting her right between the shoulder blades, and I hit her. Ha cha, ha cha. I finally dislodged that demonic piece of bubble gum. Thank you, Jesus. But from that time on, a root of fear got up in me. I'm trying to help somebody. If me looking crazy helps you, it was worth it. I developed a little root of fear that what would happen if somebody I loved with all my heart was alone chewing bubble gum and I wasn't there to save them because I was Hubba Bubba Man. I was the Superman of saving people from bubble gum choking. And this little fear that started in me as a little boy, what you, what you don't realize about crazy fear is it'll grow if you feed it. And by the time I married Carlene, I never told nobody this kind of crazy was in my head because how's she going to marry me if she knows? But right after we got married, I sealed the deal. Yes, sir. I would call her. I'd say, what are you doing? I'd be working. She'd be at the house. 
She said, I, I'm home. I just got home from work. I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm just cleaning up the house. I said, you ain't chewing bubble gum, are you? She said, no, Barry, I'm not chewing. Oh, I said, well, don't chew no bubble gum till I get home. In fact, it got so bad that bubble gum was banned in my house. And I would call my mama and my mom and anybody I halfway liked. And I would tell them not to chew bubble gum. Yes, sir. And then I got involved with God. I had defeated bubble gum, and now God was going to use me. And I was at Souls Harbor, and the Spirit of God was moving. And they, they called everybody to come up front that felt called into the ministry. Well, me and Carlene came up there, and Pastor Jack. He started laying hands on people. They started falling out under the power of God. He was prophesying to them, prophesying to them, boom, prophesy, boom, prophesy, boom. Got up to me, got ready to prophesy, and he stopped. And he said, bubble gum. And I was like, you better not chew it. It's up the devil, Pastor Jack. <laughs> this is how, how real God is. Because to everybody else it was bubble gum, but God said that, that's a fear thing that's going to keep you from being who you've called to be. He said, I see bubble gum. It's a fear tactic that the enemies used. Somebody you loved got choked on bubble gum and the devil torments you with it. Be free in the name of Jesus. He hit me in the power, went from the top of my head to the soles of my feet and all I know is when I got up I wasn't afraid of hubba bubba anymore. I feel the Holy Ghost in here. God wants to set you free. Of the silly stuff. I know how real God is because Hubba Bubba might have been funny to everybody else, but God said, I care about your silly stuff. God cares about that thing going on in your head that seems so silly. You can't tell nobody, and you don't know how to talk about it. The problem is the devil's got more faith than a lot of God's people. I got ready to call this sermon the faith of Satan, but I knew y'all would leave. Because when you study the nature of Satan, you know what happened when Satan, when Jesus came upon the garden or when it came to the manic of the Gadarenes in Mark chapter 5? The first thing demon spirits did anytime they got around Jesus is they said, Son of God, don't torment me before my time. But yet you and I live in a time in the American church where you've got preachers behind pulpits that won't declare he was the son of God. It's a sad day when the devil has more faith in Jesus than the people in his pulpit do. So just in case you don't know, I'm going to let you know. I believe he came from a virgin womb. I believe he was who God says he was. I believe he was the son of God. I believe that at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow and every tongue confess I believe that name can turn America around would you give God a praise if you're not ashamed of the name come on now somebody give him praise his name is Jesus and he wasn't a good man he was the God man it's a shame when, the, when Satan has more faith to declare who he was than people in churches across America not only did he declare he was the son of God, the Bible said he fell at his feet and he worshipped him. The devil himself, Joyce, worshipped God. And yet you've got churches all across America that won't even lift up a hand when the spirit of God is moving. Won't even say amen or hallelujah when the spirit of God is touching them. I, it's a sad day when the devil worships God better than his children do. I want us to give God some worship right now. I want you to lift up the name of Jesus right now. We will never let that spirit live in this church that tries to kill worship. Not only did Satan worship him, the Bible said he prayed. Woo. He said, I pray thee. Don't cast me into the depths. Satan prayed. Jesus, when he was doing five thousand, when he was going to feed five thousand or multiply loaves and fishes, he had five thousand. When he was equipping people to cast out devils, he had seventy. When he was teaching of the things of God, he had the twelve disciples. But when he went to pray, he only had three: Peter, James, and John. It's it's kind of scary to me that the devil would actually pray more. And some Christians do anymore. There ain't a time I get behind this pulpit that I don't get Carlene if I'm anywhere near her and I say pray for me baby because I know there's something about prayer that changes things and keeps things together. Let me hear you if you still believe in prayer in this church. Let somebody know it will help your family. It will bless your children. It will. 
Satan prayed, but Satan also, if you study the nature of Satan, he could also do something kind of scary. He could quote scripture. When he had Jesus up on the pinnacle of the temple, what did he do? He didn't preach out of the Quran or the Satanic Bible. He started using Psalms 91. Ain't it funny how the devil can take the book that was meant to bless you and try to twist it to be your ultimate demise? There are many people that the enemy has got a hold of the scriptures in their mind and turned them away from God rather than to God. Satan can quote scripture better than believers. I've come to preach a little while in here this morning. I have seen Satan twist scriptures and make happy people bitter. I know people that used to be happy little people until they got a hold of the the enemy got a hold of the word of God and made them start believing God was some grouchy, miserable man in the sky that wanted them to be grouchy little critters here on earth. Satan knows how to manipulate the scriptures. Many of you, when the enemy starts lying to you and trying to shipwreck your life, the Bible said he appears as an angel of light. The devil's never going to walk up to you, Georgia, and say, hello, I'm the devil. I'm about to mess you up. No. When the enemy starts talking, he's going to appear as somebody that loves you. He's going to, here's how he always appeared to me, as a preacher that ate about 20 pork chops. You could tell his blood pressure was about to go out the roof. He had a PhD, you know, Pentecostal hairdo. And he would pull up his britches, and he'd walk up to me and tell me how I was going to bust tail wide open. Y'all ever met that preacher? Anytime, I mean, I was a, I was a little boy. I was just being a little boy, a little boy, a little sweet boy. And the preacher walked up to him and goes, what are you going to do when you wake up in hell? Well, at six years of age, I'm thinking I'm probably going to pull the covers back over my head and sleep through it. But for the next couple of months, every morning when I'd wake up, I wouldn't open both eyes. I'd squint one eye to make sure I wasn't waking up in hell. So many times I have seen the enemy use certain people and certain figures to just speak fear and bondage into people's eyes. How does the enemy communicate to people? How does the enemy get to people in this hour? The first way he does it is spirits. See, sometimes the enemy will start messing with you, introduce a thought to your head, and nobody said it. You didn't watch it on TV. It was just a thought. Have you ever been riding down the road? I'm trying to help somebody, so I know, I know this is clicking with you. Have you ever been riding down the road and just all of a sudden a crazy thought just pop in your head? Wave at me. Y'all making me feel like I need to go to Marion. All right. A crazy thought just pop in your head. Just okay. You know, the Bible talked about how thoughts were like birds, the fowls of the air. Those are symbolic of thoughts that come in their head. You know, it ain't a bad thing for a thought to come in your head. A bird can fly over my head, but I don't let it build a nest. If you live this life, you're going to have all kinds of crazy thoughts. You're going to have mean thoughts when you're in church. You're going to have crazy thoughts that you can't tell anybody. But thoughts are not reality. But I have seen the enemy put thoughts in people's mind and then torment them that they thought it. Let me help you. If that was really your thought, it wouldn't bother you that you thought it. Ah, somebody's getting some help in here. But the enemy drops thoughts in your head and then tries to make you think they're yours. Here's how the enemy prophesies to people. He first happens by spirit. and He'll introduce a thought to your head. A thought of destruction, a thought of fear, a thought of something, whatever it is. And then a lot of times... He'll use people to amplify it. I know when, when Carlene was pregnant the second time, we lost the first baby to a miscarriage. We never heard about miscarriage or nothing. Never. As soon as she got pregnant with Grayson, every time we cut on the TV, it was about miscarriage. We would have people call us, and the first thing they wanted to talk about was what? Miscarriage. It seemed like everywhere we turned, it was miscarriage. 
what was going on there? The enemy was whispering to our ears that she was going to have a miscarriage with Grayson. And, and then everywhere we looked, it seemed like it was amplifying that. See, the Bible calls him the prince and the power of the air. What the enemy will do is he will speak a thought to you by the Spirit. I know I'm preaching old school, but somebody needs to hear something today. And then he will get the situations around your life to try to confirm the lie that Satan is telling you. I can't get no help in here, but somebody's going to leave this place free today because the enemy told me that I was going to have a nervous breakdown. I'm just going to lay it out on the line right now. As a young man, he told me I'd have a nervous breakdown and I would never make it, that I would be one of those preachers that would have a nervous breakdown and I would live my life in a padded cell. After that thought got in my head, he began to introduce me to people in situations that begin to say that same thing to me. I even come in contact with the preacher who wanted to talk to me on a daily basis who had had a nervous breakdown and had given up on the ministry and I couldn't tell Carlene what I was going through and I couldn't tell other people what I was going through but the spirit of Satan had whispered in my ear that I would have a meltdown and I would never recover and then everywhere I would turn I would see nervous breakdowns I would have people tell me this and people tell me that and the spirit of fear was just gripping my heart it was all a lie of the devil but it was just replaying see sometimes the enemy just keeps replaying that lie and I'll never forget when it broke, when things begin to shift. I was on the phone with a preacher because what I found out is when the enemy wants to talk to you, he can use saved people and he can use unsaved people. Well, me and Carlene was on the phone with this minister just needing some help from God. And he told me this right here. I'm waiting for him to tell me God's with you. You're going to make it. It's going to be okay. That preacher all them years ago said you're unqualified, you're unfit, you're going to have a nervous breakdown, you ain't going to make it you won't be in the ministry six months from now, I hung up the phone in devastation and I looked over at mama and there was a fire in her eyes and she grabbed my hand and she said get ready we're going to prove that joker wrong I just come to tell somebody every now and then you just need somebody to come in agreement with you and I've come to guess every lie of the devil and I'm going to tell you we're going to prove that joker wrong your family is going to make it your marriage is blessed your mind will not break somebody ought to give him praise about right now I stand to your feet one time and give him praise everybody give God a praise holler back at hell and let the devil know let the devil know his prophecy shall fail Woo, how do you know the devil's lying when his lips are you ever, we got a family member, I love him, Lord, we all love him, hallelujah. He ain't here, so don't get, he'll never hear this. But when this family member dies, we said we're going to put on his headstone, here lies the truth. Because it sure never came out. <laughs> Anybody got any family members like that? Wave at me right now. You know, because the only way you can tell if he's lying or not is if he's talking. If he's talking, he's lying. That's how the devil is. The Bible said he's the father of lies, and the truth is not in him. So if the enemy has told you that there's a curse, and this is going to happen, that's going to happen, you ought to praise God. Because his prophecy means the opposite. For everything the devil told me would be going on in my life right now, the opposite is true. My daughter is in college. My son is healthy and in high school. I'm still married to my wife, and we're still preaching the gospel, the exact opposite of what he told me over 10 years ago. So many times as Chelsea begins to play, the enemy just keeps on putting it, talking, talking talking and we feel like our, our mind is stuck in replay and we just keep rehearsing it's on a constant loop the fears and the worries the fears and the worries and after a while if you don't deal with that it starts, it starts breaking you down see if the devil wants to talk to you he'll first start with spirits he will use saved and unsaved people because saved people can speak to you out of the Spirit of God, or they can also say the wrong thing to you. And sometimes he'll use family. The Spirit of God, as I was praying for this message, he began to stir up in me that some of you have been whispered to by the enemy through the lips of your family. 
They told you you'd never be nothing. They told you you'd never do nothing. Some of you, every time you get ready to go forward, you hear the voice of your father or mother or somebody that should have loved you that said you'll never be nothing. And it just eats on you and eats on you. See, I was blessed. I had a, I had a dad that when I was preaching revivals, and it'd be three weeks, and we'd be going to Grady's revivals, and we'd be working on the roof. Dad would look at me, and he could tell I was wore out. And he'd say, hey, won't you go home a little bit early today and study? I had a family that was supportive of preaching the gospel. But I had a lot of people that started out with me preaching, but their wife didn't support them. Their family didn't support their vision. Their loved ones didn't support them. And you know what happened? They gave up. I realized that every time I stand behind this pulpit, I'm not standing here because of myself. I had people move that believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. I had people that encouraged me when I couldn't encourage myself. How many times do I preach to people that at key moments in your life, it was your family that talked you out of going forward. It was your family that made you look in the mirror and say, you know what, you're right. I'm a nothing. Isaiah 28, 18. Because the devil wants you to come in agreement with him. Every time we have service, I'm just trying to get you to come in agreement with God. Every time the devil talks to you, he's just trying to get you to come in agreement with him. And the one you come in agreement with determines the way you're going to walk in this life. Here's what he said in the book of Isaiah. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled, and your agreement with hell shall not stand. God brought you here today, and he brought me here today because he wants me to kill the contract you've got with the devil. Kill the contract. We're going to contaminate the contract because we're going to put the blood of Jesus on it and say, devil, that ain't the way it's going to work out. I am going to make it. I am going to be okay. God put this in the Bible so that you would know whatever contract Satan's tried to get you to sign, whatever lie he's peddled on you and he's tried to get you to come in agreement with, God says on this day we break that contract. We break that agreement. You will not go down like that. It will not happen like that. You're going to walk out of here with a fresh contract, a fresh agreement that says, I agree that God is for me and not against me. I agree that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I agree that my best days are ahead of me and they are not, but somebody ought to be getting happy right now. I agree that I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. I'm blessed in the city and I'm blessed in the field. I'm blessed coming in and baby, I'm blessed going out. I'm blessed when they like me and I'm blessed when they don't. I'm blessed when it's raining and I'm blessed in midday. You ought to give God a praise if you're blessed. Come on and praise Him if you're blessed.